actually to 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 really be, explain how I'm I'm carrying a, a baton that's that's part of a long race. I'll try to f point out where the work that I'm uh, I'm doing here has fit into a process that started long before I got involved. And I'm fortunate actually at this meeting to get to, to meet one of the guys with whom it actually started. Um, in terms of the process of drug discovery, this really follows on from the, the introduction that Terry gave us yesterday uh, as to how, what, how, how you get to that point where you've got that first starting point. Um, you haven't got a drug at that point. Um, before I get in, I, I have to put this up front. The, the number of people that are involved in, in the project of the type that I'm about to present is huge. Um, these are the people that were involved in the piece that I'm going to talk about. And to all the people at Merck that I've left off the slide, I, I duly apologize. Okay, um, I started off obviously with an introductory slide, and if I can bypass this one by, as in, in an audience such as we have today, this is akin to, uh, in England we would say, bringing calls to Newcastle. Um, the overall mortality rates for invasive fungal infections clearly are, are lacking based on everything that we've heard in the last two days. What I want to point out is that the bulk of the, work, the, the, the opportunities for drugs we have at the moment all come from the, the three classes listed here. Um, Polyenes, the azoles, obviously well exploited, glucan synthesis, the new guy on the block. However, when you consider that list of drugs up against what we have in the antibacterial field, uh, I was originally going to put up the list side by side, but frankly I got tired of counting the number of antibacterial drugs. We're woefully un uh, underrepresented on the antifungal uh, field. More than that, when you go into uh, things like the beta-lactams, we're up to the, at least the fifth generation, depending on how you count these things. There is value in each new generation that's been exploited in these well-established targets. If you transfer that thinking back to the antifungal space, some of that thinking has happened in the azoles, where clearly we've evolved the capabilities of the compounds of this class, and we're producing better and better ones. We haven't arguably done the same yet in the glucan synthesis targets. Um, uh, was mentioned uh, by John right at the very beginning, I think, that the question is whether there's any difference at all between the three compounds that uh, are currently marketed as glucan synthesis inhibitors. And so it's around here that, that the story that I want to talk to you uh, is based. Taking the story back to the, to the mid-90s, as Casper Fungin within Merck was be moving towards uh, advanced development phases, uh, Merck recognized that this was a valuable target class um, and made the decision that it would be useful to go back into the target class looking for new chemical matter. There was concern at the time, of course, as to whether the uh, lipopeptides represented by Casper Fungin could actually be uh, turned into orally available compounds. And so the search was on using the techniques that Terry alluded to yesterday to go looking for new material that would specifically act as an antifungal agent by blocking 1,3-beta-glucan synthesis. Um, the group in Spain, Merck at Spain, had identified uh, a fungus uh, called Homonema carpatinum up here, and Gerald is in the audience. So it's been a great opportunity to meet uh, one of the guys involved in the discovery. That uh, Fungus was isolated, cultured, and from uh, an activity-directed screen, uh, a, a nat new natural product was isolated that's represented by the structure here. At first glance, it's very clear, oops, excuse me. It's very clear that the structure of this, for those of you who are familiar with the chemical structure of Casper fungin, we're talking about something that is entirely different. This is not the same as a, as a, as a penicillin as to, as, a, as to a KEF. This is an entirely different structural class. Um, it was named Enfuma fungin. There's a little bit of com confusion there built in, in that it's, it's a fungin, and, and at the moment, a kenacandin tends to get used as a catch-all term for the candins. So this is, by definition, an kenacandin, although it's clearly out of a very different structural class. As we thought about how we move this forward, um, it's very clear that one needs to address when one approaches a drug discovery project, two main properties here. We need to understand how we're gonna maintain and ideally improve the potency of the compound. The, the activity against glucan synthase of the original natural product is somewhere around 100 nanogram per mil, maybe a touch more potent. Um, 
but more importantly at this early stage of the program is to understand what is likely to cause us problems on the molecule when we convert this compound from what was already known to be non-orally bioavailable into something that was able to be uh, delivered orally. We were very concerned right from the outset about the presence of this sugar ring. Uh, it was expected this, this may well cause us uh, issues in terms of, uh, of hydrolytic cleavage. The acetate up here is something that we also felt may well be subjected to e either chemical instability, uh, aqueous hydrolysis, or probably uh, uh, enzymatic hydro hydrolysis. The first thing that we needed to focus on was this, this position right here. And I do apologize, there's a lot of chemical structures I'm going to use, and uh, I, I am a chemist by training, so it comes to second nature here. Um, this position here is a, ma is a masked aldehyde function, which has well-known propensity to be reactive towards amines and other groups. We also uh, were, were fully aware that even as a natural product, this center exists as about a four to one mixture of two compounds, epimeric at this center. If nothing else, that just complicates the chemistry no end. These three features are something that we're all representing chemical issues uh, and we knew we needed to address. From a permeability issue, getting towards an orally available drug, um, typically, in, in a generic sense, carboxylic acids usually are not great. The pKa is down around four. So you tend to have a, a, an ionized group in your molecule at physiological pH, and that makes it less prone to penetrate membranes. The pKa of this guy is up at around 5.2, so it's a, it's, a, it's a less acidic carboxylic acid, which moves things in our favor. More importantly, these dotted lines represent methyl groups. This is an extremely hydrophobic region of the molecule. So the carboxylic anion, even when formed, is very highly shielded by a lot of hydrophobicity. We felt that that was probably going to make this carboxylic acid able to be carried through the synthesis, uh, uh, through the drug discovery process. There's a double bond at this position, which we were concerned about uh, metabolic oxidations. It turned out that those fears were unfounded, because nothing we could do chemically would ever touch that chemical, <coughs> that double bond. Um, you, you probably hear and read a lot about drug ability parameters in the, in the, the, the field at the moment. Um, when one considers all of the parameters usually considered at the moment, uh, the molecular weight, size, uh, hydrogen bond donors, acceptors, this is a pretty lousy starting point from all drug discovery points of view. However, when it's the only thing that comes out of the screen, activity trumps all, and this is where you go. The progression path that was used for the process was uh, the path that was put in place by the Merck group uh, and really spoke to the needs of this kind of program and the chemical matter <coughs> that we were starting with. Everything went through uh, a, a, a inhibition of uh, an assay that measured the inhibition of beta 13 glucan. I'll be expressing the numbers. I've tried to color code as much as I can. Uh, GSIC50 is represented in blue as a microgram per mil. We used uh, susceptibility assays using an Albicans MY1055 strain as the primary assay. Um, and I'll represent that in green uh, with a, a red parenthesis number that represents serum antagonism. We did all of the PK work that I'm going to show you in this particular presentation in mouse. Um, I'll use numbers representing mostly bioavailability. I, I may touch on, on some exposure information. Probably the real, you know, without doubt, the real driver towards the optimization of this kind of compounds was the incorporation of this efficacy uh, assay that, that was used at Merck. Um, I'll probably slip into the term TOCA. It refers to the target organ kidney assay. Um, the assay was run in, four, in two different modes. There was either a short-term assay, which was a four-day assay. We would in, inoculate via IV uh, administration, followed immediately by first administration of compound. Four doses of compound only were delivered on a BID schedule. Animals were sacked on day four, kidneys septically taken, and, culture, uh, and fungal burden in kidney uh, measured uh, af after grow out we demonstrate or represent the activity of a compound in the ability of the compound to reduce the, uh, the, the log CFUs at a particular dose. In a longer term assay, we do the same kind of thing, uh, but we frequently refer to the, uh, the readout here in terms of an ED99. That's the dose required to reduce log burden by two. And then we also have a survival model in, in Aspergillus. 
So where do we get to? Orienting you, I'll keep using this nomenclature right the way through where the glucan synthase activity is here, primary susceptibility in albicans, and then serum antagonism. When you take off the <coughs> offending hemiacetal group, we were delighted to find that we didn't damage either the uh, enzyme activity or the susceptibility assay. And everything that you will see from here on out is missing this, this hydroxyl group. <coughs> when we took this center and inverted it, we found that we lost activity completely. So clearly, this indicates that, that somewhere down in this region of the molecule, there's an interaction with the enzyme pocket going on. It's something that we would need to come back to. Um, when we inverted the other site, we were losing about a 10x in terms of potency, but there's still some activity there. Again, however, suggesting that we're interacting with the enzyme in some way, shape, or form. I mentioned the carboxylic acid. Uh, we, we took a look at reducing it. This was a lot of work to reduce that carboxylic acid down. And the fact that it lost us 10x activity meant that we weren't going back up here in any time soon. That simply wasn't worth the effort. When you broke the ring, we lost all activity. What was interesting was even though um, you retained the stereochemistry at this position, but worked with a different anima of glucose, we were essentially equipotent. So while this position is very sensitive, what's actually put out there may have some fluidity and we may get something that we can play with. That's where we decided to work first. We made some <coughs> simple derivatives of the sugar-bearing uh, compounds just to see where we stood. Um, quick scan across the, the compounds demonstrates that we see some interesting activity when we, 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 we place these diamino compounds off uh, the sixth position of a sugar. We haven't made any advances. We've simply found a, a, an alternate uh, approach. However, we, as we were expecting, we, we, we took a look at one or two of these compounds in my mouse experiment, mouse PK experiments. Clearance rates were running north of 200 mil per minute per kg, which when you consider liver blood flow in a mouse is about 80. We were clearly being cleared by mechanisms that were extra hepatic, almost certainly loss of the sugar. So we, we learned what we could from this area, but realized we needed to, to take the sugar out. We did that and we turned our attention back to amino acids as a source of probing SAR. Um, when we put a simple glycine uh, uh, ester onto this molecule, we have a compound that's retaining enzyme activity. As we worked our way through alcohols and acids, not preferred, again, when we get out to these diamino compounds, we're now down at compounds which, if you look exclusively at the enzyme activity, we're making some progress here. We're down to single-digit nanomolar. We haven't done anything to address this serum antagonism, which even though the MICs are running in the twos and fours, that serum antagonism is pretty significant. We took a look at a couple of these compounds in a PK experiment and we saw absolutely nothing. These compounds don't, don't make it past the, the stomach. Um, when we dosed these compounds IP to be able to establish a, a baseline in terms of activity, we, even though we dosed as high as we could, we couldn't get any evidence of in vivo activity in that TOCA assay I referred to. We chose first to focus on the oral bioavailability in the hope that we could re-establish the in vivo activity a little bit later on. The ester that I talked about uh, earlier looked like it was <coughs> likely the problem, so we turned our attention to taking the ester away and simply making ether derivatives where now these would be expected to be stable towards ester hydrolysis. Um, making the switch, we're delighted to see that we retain to a large extent the same level of enzyme activity. You'll note we haven't done anything yet about the, uh, the susceptibility potency with, with respect to serum. Um, however, what we found was this compound, and this was quite a, quite a pleasant surprise, we did indeed uh, managed to put this compound on board when we dosed the compound orally and in fact the AUC that we were the exposure that we achieved from this early stage of the project of about a half micromole hour is actually pretty good. The bioavailability is about 35% but at this stage it's the amount that actually gets on board not the relative bioavailability that's important. We took the compounds into the in vivo experiments and dosed IP even though we had oral activity and we saw nothing. 
So we're starting to get a little bit concerned at this point. Um, the serum antagonism was something that we decided that we needed to focus a lot more heavily on. And we were fortunate there was some work going on looking at other areas of the molecule. Um, a piece of speculative chemistry was performed that resulted in the oxidation of this position up here from a methylene group to a carbonyl. It was done on two particular scaffolds, either with the sugar in place or with the simple amino ester in place. The activity doesn't change, but what we chose to believe was that we, we saw an improvement in this serum antagonism. We were dropping down by four dilutions, uh, either in the sugar case or in the amino ester case. It suggested that perhaps this ketone group up here could improve the serum antagonism. The amount of chemistry that it takes to put that ketone in place is significant. It, it, there was at least a five-step diversion, and the total, total number of steps to make these compounds for the chemists in the audience was running somewhere between 12 and 14 steps. So you, you don't make a library of these a week. Having identified a feature, though, that would give us that improvement in serum antagonism, it was clear what we need to do now is combine that back with our potent esters and ethers that I showed you on the previous slides. And when we made the uh, amino acid ester derivatives, now in the presence of this ketone group, when we dosed these compounds IP, we were able to see good, robust, reproducible activity in the efficacy model. This gave us, for really for the first time, confidence that we were indeed chasing a series that, that had legs. This was something that we could take uh, all the way. These compounds were not uh, orally available, uh, consistent with the, the previous data, so the ketone doesn't really affect the oral bioavailability. However, we took the ketone onto the series that had given us the oral exposure uh, I indicated earlier, which were these ether derivatives. The potencies are fine. The serum antagonism, still not great, but it's improving. <coughs> we dosed these compounds, not orally, but just IP to be able to establish the activity, and we could not find any in vivo activity out of these compounds. This compound in particular, we dosed every which way come Sunday at, uh, to as high a dose as we could possibly get in. We demonstrated 50 to 60 micromolar concentrations in kidney and over 200 micromolar in liver. We couldn't find any evidence of activity at all. I think when Terry spoke yesterday, he alluded to, to the, the bottom point was divine intervention. Uh, you need some luck, you need some perseverance in, in these sorts of programs. Along the way, we, we developed chemistry that would make very simple modifications, which from a diversity analysis would say that there's no reason at all these compounds are any different from the earlier ones. All we've done is we've put one methyl group at this point here in the context of a compound that has a molecular weight of nearly 600. However, when we dosed this compound, IP, in that TOCA assay, we saw something. Our cutoff for activity, I must say, at this stage of the, the game, was two log reduction. So anything that didn't give us two log reduction, we didn't really consider as, as being efficacious. There was a debate in the team as to whether that was real or not, but we decided to go with it. When we made a couple of more simple, simple derivatives, we had something that was giving us activity. To this day, I cannot tell you why these work <coughs> and these don't. Um, but in the drug discovery business, I found that you have to take the activity when it's presented and just keep moving. With the uh, simplistic approach that we need branching next to the nitrogen to establish the in vivo activity, this is where chemistry kicks into higher gear. <coughs> and we were able to make a series of compounds that when delivered IP now, the in vitro potencies are staying about the same. We're not really making any headway. But what we're seeing in vivo is a significant uh, antifungal activity now. We're able to drive down that, uh, that, that fungal burden by over three logs um, using compounds that we have also demonstrated are orally bioavailable. You can't go uh, ad infinitum with this process as you push the chain out a little bit further. You do start to pick up more serum antagonism and you lose the activity in vivo. Um, as you alkylate the nitrogen, you get compounds which, from a, a drug development point of view, we have bioavailabilities that are as good as anyone could, could possibly hope for at this point. So we had a way in. 
a lot of data on this, this slide. I, I won't dwell too long on this. Um, we obviously varied out the side chains, bulked up even more by putting not only one group, but two groups, and then making those two groups even bigger. Um, and by this time, we were really being driven almost entirely by the efficacy in the TOCA assay. Because in, buried in there is a measure of in vitro potency as well as oral exposure and, uh, and intrinsic activity. Two compounds started to emerge here, which may not show up too well. Numbers four and five compounds which are getting down towards 10 nanogram per mil activity on the enzyme. The susceptibility numbers are quite good and the, the aspergillus activity is there as well. I start to bring this in. Um, their potency in vitro, in vivo, sorry, was, was quite good. And the bioavailability, the, the PK parameters are, are looking quite respectable. These two compounds were actually selected for what we would call workup process, where we decided to focus in on them and call them preclinical candidates. The two compounds on this slide are, are the what compounds with either two methyl groups, sorry, two methyl groups or one methyl group. Uh, Activity in the in vitro uh, enzyme assay, we're, we're now down 13, 14 nanogram per mil. Comparable activity, if not a little bit better, in the glucan synthase assay derived from fumigatus. The susceptibility numbers are looking good. Um, efficacy in that four-day assay, once we focused in and, and resolved at this position, we'd, we have compounds that are extremely potent in that four-day TOCA assay. Um, not too surprisingly, when you take them into now a seven-day assay dosing BID, we see ED99 numbers that are down around single digit mg per kg range. Uh, the bioavailability and the PK parameters I'm showing in mouse were, were satisfactory as they were in rat, dog and monkey as well. These compounds were looked at for spectrum, uh, compared head to head with Casper fungin in a similar format. Uh, and you see that we're seeing uh, activities against the various candida species that compare reasonably well, not as potent as Casper fungin, but good enough for where we are, we thought. Um, it was time to look at these compounds in a little bit more detail. This was the first time that we had a compound out of this class that we could ask questions about mechanism and, and ask questions about whether these, these compounds are as fungicidal in the same way that, that's observed for Casper fungin. And indeed, when, when kill, kill curve experiments were performed, um, taking cells and, and growing out after various times of incubation, you, you see that we see a good, excuse me, a good strong uh, uh, sidal response for both Casper fundin as well as the two compounds of interest. Fluconazole, as you'd expect, shows up as static in this kind of experiment. Testing against clinical isolates that are resistant to uh, or reduce susceptibility to, to fluconazole, compounds remains, uh, remain active. Uh, again, at MICs that are comparable to, to that which is observed for Casper fungin. And Merck were able to pull isolates out of their own library, which were clinical isolates showing reduced susceptibility to Casper fungin. And for the first time, we were able to demonstrate that, that a compound out of the Enfuma fungin class displays significant activity against uh, typical reduced susceptibility strains. Uh, most of which bear the kinds of hotspot uh, mutations in the FKS genes that, you, that you're obviously familiar with. That statement holds true for both albicans as well as cruzii. So we have a class of compound that is operating as a GS inhibitor, but is clearly distinct as a class from the, uh, from the Casper fungin or the candens, let me call them that. However, things were not quite as smooth as you might expect. Um, along the way, we'd obviously incorporated that the alkylation on nitrogen as a way to improve uh, the PK profile. We demonstrated along the way that those compounds are metabolically cleaved, and they're cleaved by 3A. So while we're not, these compounds were not uh, inhibit, significant inhibitors of any of the, uh, the human isoforms, um, direct by direct inhibition measurements, when you're uh, a substrate for C3A4, you're going to be a competitive substrate. So that's an issue. We examined the compounds in a, the Aspergillus survival model and found that the compounds, even when delivered at relatively high dose, admittedly PO, we simply couldn't get the kind of activity in the Aspergillus model that Casper fungin was able to demonstrate. 
And I did mention along the way that we put a lot of chemistry into place to be able to make some of these compounds. These, this was a long, long synthesis starting from a natural product. These three parameters were deemed to be uh, suitably uh, uh, high, a higher barrier, that it was worthwhile engaging in an entirely new reinvestigation of the molecule. So those two compounds were set to one side, and we went back into the chemistry and looking for an entirely new uh, <coughs> profile. The objectives for that backup were obviously improved potency, both against Candida as well as Aspergillus, we wanted something that would give us a simpler method, uh, met metabolic fate, as well as ideally a simplified structure. And really by simplified structure in the parlance of a pharmaceutical industry means it costs less to make. Um, there was a piece of chemistry that had been developed and dis discovered and developed along the way, um, whereby, you'll have to forgive me, this is the chemist in me coming out now. This oxygen at the bridgehead participates very, very strongly with this C2 carbon, uh, such that under certain conditions, this group leaves and you form an intermediate like this, which allows you to bring into the molecule all sorts of uh, a variety of X groups. Very reproducible and very friendly chemistry, and we use this a lot. We took a look at this position early on in the, uh, the program, and we made things where there was an ethyl or an amide group at this position, and we really weren't making any headway, so we, we let it sit. We didn't go into it. A reinvestigation by a couple of guys, and I have to shout out a guy called Bob Wilkening at, uh, at Merck, did a phenomenal job here. Started investigating some nitrogen heterocycles, uh, and we're seeing a little bit of activity in the context of having a sugar group out at this lower position here. Still nothing to get too excited about until Bob did the work using one of the optimized side chains that we run into as part of the earlier cycle. This, I think, is a clear demonstration of context-dependent uh, activity and how you can't just transfer one group uh, from a molecule to the next. When Bob used this uh, side chain and did this same introduction, you see we, we have compounds that are looking reasonably active, reasonably active, until we ran into this compound here. And now we have a compound that's not only getting down to single digit nanomolar on, uh, on GS, but is starting out with a, with a relatively good position in terms of serum antagonism. Quick substitutions around this ring led us to this compound in a relatively short space of time. And now we have achieved a level of potency that we really considered this to be an entirely new class of compound. And it was this discovery that caused the previous two compounds to be set to one side because this looked far more interesting. Bob and the group went back into this, uh, this, this triazole-bearing compound, did a quick investigation out of this lower chain again, and ran into these kinds of compounds, very, very similar to what I showed you earlier, but the profile is looking uh, quite good. Um, when examined in the TOCA assay, these compounds, initially one might say that this is not quite as potent as I showed you previously, However, you'll notice that we do not have the dependency on that 12 keto. So we've removed the group that was causing us a significant amount of problems in terms of chemical complexity and cost of goods. We took these compounds, obviously, into this TOCA assay and via the oral route. Um, we were getting good, good activity. Our exposures were not particularly great at this point, and it was very clear simply by looking at dose solutions that we were having solubility issues that almost certainly were attributable, we thought, to, the, to this amide unit up here. And so a final sequence was performed, and I, I'm skipping obviously a reasonable amount of work here, where this amide was transformed into a couple of pyridines, and this particular pyridine here is a compound that now inhibits albicans glucan synthase with a uh, sub-nanogram per mil activity, is very potent uh, in, on the, uh, the albican strain, and shows a, a minimum or a, a good number even in the presence of serum. When taken into the TOCA assay, we see for the first time potencies, uh, uh, log reductions of around uh, four and a half, but we're also starting to see sterilization of animals even in this very short term uh, dosing schedule. This compound is actually what is now SCY078 was nominated originally as MK3118 
and was selected for development and has moved its way through the, uh, the development path. When looked at in the seven day uh, experiment, the dose required to achieve a two lung reduction is now less than one mg per kg and we see complete sterilization of the animals at doses at 12 mg per kg and below. When the compound is looked at in the Aspergillus survival experiments, uh, <coughs> dose responsive uh, activity in the Aspergillus uh, study with almost complete uh, uh, protection when dosed as high as six mg per kg. So the potency clear and activity clearly superior to the two compounds I alluded to earlier. Compound is a very potent inhibitor, not only of Aldecan's GS, but also the GS from uh, Fumigatus. It is sidal, as one would anticipate from this class of compound. Um, notably, when it was looked at uh, for resistance generation, the barrier to resistance uh, is up around 10 to the minus 9th, uh, which is comparable to the, uh, the, the resistance barrier that one sees with Casper fungin itself suggesting that the barrier to resistance may well be quite high to this kind of compound. In a uh, uh, susceptibility tests, again using clinical isolates, uh, you see that the uh, range of activity against candidate species is relatively good. Little bit of issue we, we suspected with Tropicalis and possibly Cruzii. There were experiments, animal experiments done with these Tropicalis strains and the compound retains activity in vivo against these strains that it shows lower sensitivity to in vitro. So we're not as concerned as, as we might be. Um, as you'd expect from what I showed you from previous compounds, the compound's very active against azole uh, resistant uh, organisms and retains good activity against the panel of uh, isolates that uh, Casper fungin reduce susceptibility. The compound was taken forward, and I acknowledge Shelley Truxis, uh, for, who, who led the team at Merck, moving the compound into clinical development. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, the goal here was stay with the glucan synthase mechanism, produce a compound that is able to be delivered orally. I'm going to finish up by showing you that when you dose the compound at doses ranging from 10 mg per kg all the way up to 1600 mg per kg, uh, sorry, milligram total dose, you see uh, nice, uh, steady uh, dose, uh, dose proportional exposure. The compound was well tolerated, up to doses of 1,600 uh, milligrams total dose, which puts way more compound on board than, than we anticipate needing to, to give us coverage, um, with no serious adverse events. SCYO78 is obviously currently in clinical studies. It's in a phase two clinical study. Um, I'd be happy to report out when the data is available. And thank you.